Good morning. It is 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, November the 16th, 2021. We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. Uh, we want to say a very special welcome to Martin Weiss, Arthur Kramer, Virtual Academy, James Bowie, and Siegelville, all from the dynamic Dallas Independent School District. Thank you for joining us this morning. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash three dash five restoration and sign up for us, please. We use this for our numbers. Uh, the program this morning will be force in motion. During this virtual field trip, students will observe a descriptive investigation to explore the effect of force on an object. Mr. Dominguez will tell you all about push and pull. Mr. Monroe will talk about gravity a pendulum investigation by Ms. Ramirez, and magnetism by Ms. Schramm. Teachers or your students, you cannot ask a verbal question during this program, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash question space answer, fill out a short question and send it to us, and we will do our best to answer it during the program. And if not, I'll send the answer to your teacher. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, now I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Dominguez is going to talk about pushing and pulling. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez. And what you're watching is the entire EEC staff take a little trip down to the Post Oak Preserve to do some water quality testing at our lake. But this video is not about water quality. It's about force and motion. I was thinking as we drove, you know, accelerated, decelerated, and changed directions, that the motion of driving is a really good example of what unbalanced forces do to a balanced system. You may be wondering two things right now. What's an unbalanced force, and maybe even what a force is? Well, in this portion of your virtual field trip, I will talk to you about force in regards to motion, I will define a push and a pull, and I will also talk about how unbalanced forces change a balanced system. So guys, let's get moving and let's get this presentation started. All right guys, let's talk about motion first. And what is motion? So simply put, motion is the movement of an object from place to place. So let me demonstrate. If I move this isopod plushie from the center to this location, was it in motion? I think it was. If I move it back to its initial location, was it in motion? Yes. So as I move the plushie from place to place, it is in motion. Okay, so that's what motion is. However, in order for motion to occur, there needs to be forces applied to the object for that movement to happen. So what are two forces that we can apply to this isopod? Well, what did you see? If I move it this way, like I did at the beginning, what did my hand do? It pulled it to the right. Now, if I were to move it over here, what is my hand doing? Let's repeat that. What am I doing? I'm pushing it, right? So the forces that make movement possible are a push and a pull. So let's review what we just learned. So we learned that motion is an object's movement from place to place to place to place, and that in order for that movement to occur, there needs to be forces applied to that object in the form of either a push or a pull. Hey guys, so I'm about to set up a demonstration that will show us how unbalanced forces work. Uh, 
But before I do that, I want to set up a balanced system. And I'll be doing that with a lemon. Some people use eggs. Uh, just in case our demonstration goes wrong, I prefer to use lemons, less of a mess. Uh, we're gonna need a, a plate. I have this aluminum plate, um, baking plate right here, uh, but any plate will work. Uh, you're gonna need a, a used toilet paper roll um, or napkin roll, doesn't matter, um, and a glass of water. So what we're gonna do is we are going to set up a system in which our forces are balanced, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our glass of water, we are going to put the plate on top of the glass of water, and our roll of toilet paper um, in the middle, and followed by our lemon. So as you can see, uh, after I set this up, there's no movement. Um, so all the forces that are acting, uh, on this lemon are balanced. And what forces are we talking about? Well, we're talking about our gravitational force and the reactive force that acts, uh, equally, but in the opposite direction. So what we're going to do in order for any movement to occur in this system is, uh, introduce an unbalanced force, uh, but we'll do that in slow motion so you guys can get a uh, better look at what that unbalanced force was. And please let me know if it was a push or a pull. So let's take a look. So guys, consider the way that you move and let's examine how these adorable animals are moving themselves. They are constantly exerting a series of pushes and pulls that are unbalanced forces that allow them to overcome the gravitational forces and the friction uh, and the air resistance, all of those forces that want to keep them stationary. In order for us to move and do things like hop, jump, uh, and for these animals hunt, unbalanced forces are the key to movement. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip. Here we have Ollie demonstrating the forces needed for a comfy nap. You can see him pushing and pulling his way into a comfortable position. All right, guys, until next time, have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. Uh, student, I'm going to speak to you. Describe push and pull. When you push a friend on a swing, you're using the force of push. Pushing moves something in the direction of the push. The harder the push, the further the item goes. Pulling something has a similar action. The harder you pull, the faster something moves along. And now, Mr. Monroe, you're going to tell us about gravity. Morning, everyone. We're going to be looking into that amazing force that we call gravity. In fact, the gentleman that discovered gravity, Sir Isaac Newton, ah, the way that he discovered it was kind of amazing. He simply was out looking at the forces of nature when he noticed, according to the legend, that this apple fell from a tree, fell to the ground. Back when I was in the fourth grade, fifth grade, the legend was told in a different way. They actually said that the apple hit Sir Isaac Newton in the head. But however, or whatever happened, it forced Newton to realize that there was some force acting on the falling objects. Otherwise, they would not start moving from that state of rest. 
And that's how he came to the conclusion that gravity existed. Now, what is gravity? The first thing that we associate gravity with is the pulling downward that holds everything in place on our planet, okay? That's how we associate it. But gravity exists everywhere, not just pulling us down, but it, according to Sir Isaac Newton, everything that is made up of mass or has matter is attracted to each other. <coughs> He came to the conclusion, the larger the mass an object has, the stronger pull it has, the stronger gravitational pull. He also found out gravitational pull was affected, a factor that affected, it was the distance between the objects that we were, that you were observing the pull. Now, we don't feel the pull from one object to another ourselves right now. But we do feel the pull from underneath us because the planet Earth's gravity is much stronger than the gravity pull that we would have with an object that would be close to us. I hope you kind of understand that. Now, again, I want you to remember, the more mass an object has, the stronger the pull. The more distance between the objects, the weaker the gravitational pull. Now, Couple of things I want you guys to consider as we go through the rest of this presentation. Cause you maybe ask these questions later on on a test or maybe your teacher would just come out and ask you. And the question, first question is, how does gravity affect living things? I want you to be thinking about that. And then also, why does the planet Earth have more gravity pull than the moon that orbits around us. And hopefully as we go through the presentation, you'll get an idea how to answer those, okay? Now, just like Sir Isaac Newton was sitting under that tree, that object fell from a state of rest, that apple. And I've got a ball right here and we're gonna make it fall. And we saw it fall, didn't we? I hope you saw that fall. Now, listen students, sometimes, we refer to objects that are only being acted on by gravity as in a bit of free fall. And it is said, according to Newton, that for every second an object is falling, it's speeding up its velocity or speed toward the gravitational pull. In this case, the closer the ball got to the floor, it began to speed up or the velocity increased. Another thing, I've got a, uh, well, this is a book on fossils of North America. Right now, I'm holding this book. It's not being pulled to the floor simply because the forces that are acting on it are what we call balance. You heard Mr. Domingo talk about that, okay? Now, gravity's pulling on it. I'm holding it up. So right now, it's in a state of rest. The forces that are acting on it are balanced. Now, if I take my hands out from under it, then the forces acting on it are unbalanced. The gravitational pull will be stronger than any other force acting on it. So I'm going to pull my hands out from under, and we know what's going to happen, right? It failed. Unbalanced force of gravity pulled it down. You know, and things falling, I used to really get confused about things. I, I'd always heard that it doesn't make any difference about the size. If they're dropped from the same height, they will hit the, hit the surface at the same time. Well, I have a large marble and a small marble, and I'm gonna hold them evenly. Now, you're not gonna be able to see when they hit the floor, but they will make a sound. And I believe they're gonna hit at the same time. Are you ready? Wow. I kind of let that little one go a little later, but it was almost exactly the same time that they hit the floor. Something else I found out too. 
There are other forces that act on falling objects. Here I have a leaf, an oak leaf. And here I have an acorn that came from the oak tree. If I drop them, which one do you think is going to hit the floor first? You guys already know the acorn is going to hit first. And it did. One of the reasons was that there was another force acting on the leaf because the surface of the leaf and its mass or its weight was affected by what we call air resistance. So there was more of a free fall with the acorn because the air resistance, of course it did affect it, but not as much as it affected the leaf because of the surface of the leaf and the actual weight of the leaf, okay? So the air resistance had a tremendous effect on that. You know, we use gravity in our everyday lives, don't we? We use it on tools, we use it on uh, getting construction work done. You know, you've heard the term leveraging and all that. We use gravity in everything we do. In fact, everything that is made up of mass or matter is affected by gra uh, gravity. And it also has, again, that attraction to each other. Now, here today, when your mom or your grandmother's doing some cooking, they got all these fancy gadgets like digital uh, timers. And in fact, a lot of the stoves and the microwaves have timers. But long ago, like when my great grandmother was cooking, all she knew to do was to build that fire and didn't even have a watch but they had something that depended on gravity called an hourglass. This is an actual hourglass that belonged to my great grandmother. Now, the way that it worked, it used gravity. You see, this chamber here has sand or salt in it, and this chamber is empty. So when they started something and they wanted it to last for an hour, or maybe cook for an hour, they would flip this over and gravity would start pulling the sand through that little opening. And evidently, these were constructed in a way that they knew that when all of the substance in this upper chamber had drained down into the bottom, one hour had passed. So that's one example how gravity was used in an old fashioned timer. Well, listen, guys, you know, our universe is held together, our solar system, our universe, is held together with the force of gravity. It governs all those bodies that make up our solar system. And the planet Earth and the other planets that make up our solar system, they are orbiting or they are revolving around our massive sun. Now, remember when I said the larger the mass, the stronger the gravitational pull. Well, in this sense, I've got a model here. And our planet, the planet Earth, orbits around the sun. But we have something that is orbiting around us. It is our moon. And each of the objects that I've just discussed has a different gravitational strength. The sun is the most massive part of our solar system, okay? So it stands to reason that the sun has a real, real strong gravitational pull. It has the strongest gravi gravitational pull than any other object in our solar system, okay? So that means that its pull is keeping all the other objects at a distance and it's a constant distance in their orbit. I want you to remember that because we're gonna talk about how gravity is important to living things. Now, it is said that the sun actually has 28 more times the gravitational pull than the earth has. And that the earth has about eight times more gravitational pull than our moon. And that's because of their size. Now, this model here, it's not scaled to size and it's sure not scaled to the distance between the objects. 
that we're talking about right now. So the important thing about life on our planet, students, is the fact that our orbit from the sun, our distance from the sun is kept at that distance because of the gravitational pull, which is allowing our planet to stay far enough away from the sun, but yet close enough to the sun. Far away from the sun, so that we're not getting burned up by the sun's heat energy, okay? And close enough to the sun where we are warm and kept warm instead of our planet being a cold, dead planet. So the orbit that we have around the sun created by its gravitational pull is detrimental or it's very important to life on our planet because if we were too close, life, is our planet, life on our planet could not and would not exist the way we know it. And if we were too far away, the same thing. Life on our planet could not and would, would not exist as we know it. Now, listen. There are animals that we often see that defy gravity. <laughs> they do. I've got a little animal down here I want to share with you guys. Her name is Bessie. Bessie is a bird. Come here, Bessie. Bessie is a quail. She loves to fly. A lot of times she will just run because she is a quail. Now, when she flies, that's one way that she is moving from one place to another. And as she flies, she's using energy in her wings to go airborne so that she is actually defying gravity. But eventually, if she gets where she's going or she gets tired, then gravity is going to pull her back to the ground. Isn't that right, Bessie? I have another animal up here that's a perfect example of defying gravity. And he hops from one place to another, unless he's in water. You guys probably know what kind of animal I'm talking about. And that's Hoppy the Bullfrog. Hang on a minute. Hoppy the Bullfrog has some very muscular legs has big old wide web feet that is an excellent platform, him, platform for him to spring off of. And he hopped from one place to another while he's on land. Well, guess what? Gravity acts on him too, because if he hops, he's gonna come down pretty quick. And so he's all ready to hop forward and hop up again. He's on his way. Can you imagine if Hoppy lived on the moon? how far he probably could hop. Man, he could probably hop quite a way, but that's Hoppy the Bullfrog. Now, you see, gravity is very important to all of us. It sustains life on our planet. And I'm gonna stop talking because I run out of time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer them for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Question is, how do you explain gravity? Gravity is a force which tries to pull two objects towards each other. Anything which has mass also has a gravitational pull. The more massive an object is, the stronger its gravitational pull is. Earth's gravity is what keeps you on the ground and what causes objects to fall. And now, Mr. Maris is going to tell you all about forces affecting a pendulum. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about pendulums and the forces that affect them. So a pendulum is simply, think of a swinging object. So think of the swing that you might see at your playground. That is an example of a pendulum. So I'm going to show you another example of a pendulum that I have here at the Environmental Center. This is one of my rabbit's favorite toys to play with. It has a bar right here. There's a string, and at the end of the string are various chew toys that the rabbit can play with. Now notice it acts like a pendulum because it has a swinging motion. Now, unfortunately, my two rabbits are at the vet today, so I can't show you them, but I do have a video of them playing with that pendulum. So let me share that video uh, with you guys. So let me share the screen and we'll take a quick look at them playing. So this happens to be Lucky Bunny and he is going to be playing with the swinging pendulum. 
This pendulum happens to be a little bell that is tied to a string. So as you watch the video, be thinking about how can you describe the motion of that pendulum and also think about what forces might be involved in its motion. So there's baby bunny exploring uh, how that thing is moving. Now I will say that he is applying a force. He is using his nose, he's pushing the bell. So the first force we have is a push. So baby bunny Lucky is pushing the bell. The bell ends up moving, it falls back because of the force of gravity. So remember gravity is that force that pulls everything back down to earth. And then it's gonna keep moving even though he's not touching it anymore. It's gonna keep moving because of inertia. So inertia is just the ability of an object to stay in motion unless another object acts on it. In this case, the other force that is acting on that uh, swinging bell, there's friction. So we have friction from the uh, string to the wire cage, and then there's also some air resistance in there as well. So we do have a variety of forces that are acting on that swinging pendulum. So we have gravity, which is pulling the pendulum down. Again, think about when you guys jump up, gravity is that force that is pulling you back down. We have inertia, which simply states that objects in motion will stay in motion unless another force stops or slows it down. And then we also have friction, which is that force that slows motion down. So let me go ahead and stop our screen share and we're gonna look at just a quick history of the pendulum. So the history behind the pendulum, the story goes that a scientist named Galileo was sitting in church. He happened to look up and he noticed that the chandeliers were actually swinging back and forth. Now, sometimes those chandeliers were doing a big swing and sometimes they were doing a little swing. And being the good scientist that he was, he wondered, well, why is that? So he actually devised an experiment to help test and understand the way swinging objects move. So we actually consider Galileo the father of experimental science. And we are actually gonna conduct our own little experiment with a pendulum. And you guys can do this at home. This is just a simple handmade pendulum. So here we have, uh, let's go over some of the parts of our pendulum. We have the top part, which is called the arm. Attached to the arm, we have the string. And uh, the string at the bottom is called a weight or a bob. In this case, I'm just using a washer. And I have three string links. I have a short string that's only five centimeters. I have a middle string that's 10 centimeters. And then I have a long string that's 20 centimeters. So for today, for our test experiment, we're gonna answer this question with our test. We're gonna see how does the string length affect the number of swings in 15 seconds? And we're gonna fill out this chart. So we're gonna try and see which string will swing the most times in 15 seconds. So go ahead and make your guess, which string do you think that will be? The five, the 10, or the 20 centimeter? And maybe think about why do you think that way? So when I talk about a complete uh, swing, uh, this is what a complete swing looks like. So I'm gonna apply a force. I'm gonna pull the pendulum up. That's the starting position. When I release it, the force of gravity is pulling it back down and it stays in motion, even though I'm not touching it because of inertia. So remember inertia says that this is gonna keep swinging unless something stops it. And in this case, we know that that something is friction. So we have friction acting on the string and the little arm up here, and we have some air resistance in the room as well. Now a complete swing is the time it takes to go back to the first position. So if my position is first right here, it's gonna go this way, forward and then it's going to come back. When it comes all the way back to where I released it, that's one swing. So I'm going to set our timer for 15 seconds and I'm going to put my hand at the back so it's easier for you guys to see and I will also count uh, out loud so that you guys can actually see it. I know it's hard to tell from the computer screen. So go ahead and make your guess and also think about how many swings do you think this five centimeter string will have. So let me start our timer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, oops, and there's our timer. So that was about 27 swings. So for the five centimeter, I'm gonna write 27. 
So make your guess for the 10 centimeter. How many swings do you think it will have? Again, I'm going to apply my force. I'm going to pull it to the starting position. I'm going to drop it and gravity will do its thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Oops, and there's our timer. That's about 21 swings for the middle string. So, so far we have 27, 21. Make a guess for how many you think the long string will have. I'm gonna set my timer. I'm gonna apply my force. I'm gonna pull it up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Oops, and there's our timer. It was about seventeen. So from our results, just from the first round, we can tell that the shortest string actually had the most number of swings at twenty-seven. So a good scientist would actually repeat this experiment at least three times to get accurate results. Uh, because we're on a time limit, we're not gonna have time to do that, but you can actually complete this experiment at home making your own pendulum. So I'm gonna show you how. So all you need is just a pencil, a piece of string, and then something at the bottom. I just used a paper clip. So you can use whatever you have at home to make your swinging pendulum. If you wanna repeat our experiment, you can change the length of the string but you can also change other variables. So you might wanna see what happens if you use something light versus something heavy. You might also wanna see what happens if you release it from way up here versus if you release it from way down there. Does that make a difference? So there's a variety of different experiments that you guys can do with a pendulum. So just to review, these are some of the forces that are impacting our pendulum. We have gravity, which is pulling that pendulum back down. We have inertia, which is keeping that pendulum moving until friction slows it down. So those are some of the forces. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayers. And a question, what forces act on a simple pendulum? A simple pendulum is defined to have a point mass, also known as a pendulum bob, which is suspended from a string of length L with the negligible mass. Here, the only forces acting on the bob are the force of gravity, i.e. the weight of the bob, and the tension force from the string. Thank you again, Mr. Ramirez. Now, Ms. Shram is going to tell you about magnetism. Hey, friends, it's Ms. Shram, and I am going to be talking all about magnetism and magnetic force. So let me get my screen going. Doo -doo -doo. Okay. Okay, we're ready. All right, so at the end of my little section, you'll be able to design a descriptive investigation that tests the effect of magnets on an object. So before we do our experiments, we need to understand how magnets interact with one another. So you'll notice these little bar magnets that I have that we're gonna to use today, and you may have in your classroom as well, have a red side and a blue side. So on the screen, it has an N on the red side and an S on the blue side. So those are the magnetic poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. All magnets have magnetic poles, but these are designed for classroom use, so they're clearly labeled so we know which, what, which end is which. So I want to know how the magnets interact with one another. So what happens when I bring two north poles together, a north and a south pole together, or two south poles together? So I'm going to let you see my work table, and I'm going to bring two magnets together. I'm going to let this one be and then bring this one close and see what kind of interaction we get. So this one the North Pole pushes away the other North Pole. Oop, oop. So these two push apart. If I bring these close, they repel each other. They're pushing apart. I can feel the magnetic force between the two, even though we can't see it. Now, if I flip this one around and bring the South Pole towards the North Pole, 
Let's see what's gonna happen. It pulls it along. So they are attracted to each other. If I hold them close, they almost snap right together. So they attract. Now, if I flip this one around and bring this close, the two south poles also repel. So they push apart. And once again, I can feel that tension. I can feel them pushing apart when I try to bring them close to each other. So let's look at our little results. All right, so two north poles together, they pushed apart. That means they repel. A north and a south pole together, pull together, that means they attract. And then two south poles together, repel again. So what kind of pattern do you see? I see that when you have like poles, they will repel. And when you have opposite poles, they will attract. So we'll have to remember that for one of our experiments later. So let's talk about the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is the area around the magnet that is affected by the magnet. So the picture on the left has um, a bar magnet like what we've been using, and then also little iron filings. So iron filings are just a bit of um, the metal iron that has been shaved off into little tiny pieces, kind of like glitter or something like that. So those are just sprinkled around the magnet. And the purpose of this is to show the shape of the magnetic field. So you can see that they kind of form lines around the magnet. There's large concentration of iron filings near each pole. And then as you move further out from the pole, the iron filings are just kind of scattered around, um, not really like being affected by the magnet. Then if you look on the right, there's just a diagram to kind of show you the magnetic force around the magnet as well. All right, so here are some objects that you use every day, some more than others, um, that use magnetic force or magnetic technology. So we have compasses, which are used to tell us what direction we're going. Um, certain trains called maglev trains use um, propulsion and magnets to um, power them and make them move forward. Then computers, speakers, all your iPads, your phones, all those technologies uses magnetics inside. Um, electric motors, if you go to the doctor, the machinery they use uses strong magnets like the MRI machine. And even in your kitchen, the appliances use magnetic technology like refrigerators and microwaves. So before we do our some experiments, just review, attract, means pull together, repel means push apart, and magnets attract metal objects that contain iron, nickel, or cobalt. So those are the three main metals that are attracted to magnets. All right, so let's do some experiments. So you learned about pendulums with Miss Ramirez, and we are going to use this little pendulum that I made. All it is is a string with a paper clip on it, and I'm going to hold that here, and I can stop the, pa uh, the paper clip from swinging just by using my magnet, or I can make it swing more. So I bring my magnet close, and I can pull it, make it swing. I could stop it from swinging because this paper clip contains either iron, nickel, or cobalt. I'm guessing either nickel or iron. All right, then what else I have. So like before I showed you these iron filings in that picture, so I have some here and I put them in my Petri dish just so they don't make a mess. But let's see what happens when I bring the magnet underneath the Petri dish. So here we go. And as soon as I bring the magnet close, it kind of looks like those um, iron filings stand up on end. And I can actually move them from beneath the Petri dish around the thing. So I could pull them just by using a magnetic force. So there we go, there's our iron interaction. Then I have a compass. So you'll notice that the compass has different letters. It has N, W, oh, sorry, N, W, S, E. So that's North, East, South, and West. And those are our cardinal directions. 
So the way a compass works is that this red arrow always points north. Now they work because the compass arrow is magnetized and it works with the Earth's magnetism. The Earth is one big giant magnet. You know we have a north and south pole, but we also have a north and south magnetic poles. So I can kind of mess with this magnet, or sorry, with this compass by bringing my magnet near. So you could see as I bring my magnet near, I can make the um, compass point any direction I want. And if I flip my magnet around, the arrow will also flip around. Here, let me bring that in view a little better. There you go. So that is how the compass uses magnets. All right, then I have one last experiment and it's going to be to make this car move with magnets. So I've taped a bar magnet to the top of this little car and it's just a little race car for kids. And um, if you try this one at home or at school, just make sure you don't tape um, too much on the wheels because then they'll get stuck. So this is the part where you need to use your knowledge of opposites attracting and um, like poles repelling. So I'm going to set my little car. Oh, I almost closed you. Okay. I'm going to set my little car down. And if I want her to move forward and the south pole is in the back, I'm going to have to approach her car with a south pole. So if I bring her up, whoop, there she goes. If I want her to back up, I bring the north pole. Whoops. She got a little wonky. Whoa. There she goes, backing up. Oh, I must not be completely straight on here. That's the tricky part with the tape. Like I said, it gets stuck on the wheels and then it gets kind of wonky. Well, let's try. There she goes. <laughs> all right, so you get the idea and you could try that one later on your own. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I hope to see you next time. During this virtual field trips to observe a descriptive investigation to explore the effect of force on an object. Mr. Dominguez talked to you about push and pull. Mr. Grab Mr. Monroe talked about gravity. Pendulum investigation was done by Ms. Ramirez and Ms. Ram just told you about magnetism. Thank you teachers for joining us. If you would go to www.tiny.cc slash three dash five feedback, fill out a very short form and send it to us. We hope you have a great rest of the day, but more importantly, I want you to have a great rest of your life. Thank you again. Have a good day. <laughs>